Good afternoon all. My name is Sophie Hooper and I will be your host for today's webinar, which is brought to you in collaboration with Plan Radar. Once again, I've got a fantastic panel with me and I'll let them introduce themselves shortly. As you will know by now, the building and fire safety regulatory space has been much changed over the last few years. The landmark Building Safety Act has come into law. The Fire Safety Act has now commenced and flat door, front doors and external wall systems are explicitly falling within the scope of the fire risk assessments. And the Fire Safety England regulations 2022 have been published and will come into force from January 2023 which means those managing safety in high-rise buildings and some 11 meters plus buildings will need to comply with a series of information requirements and maintenance regimes from January 2023. And one example is for, to install and maintain a secure information box. These pieces of legislation are, however, just beginning, and many of the details around the golden thread requirements, the what and the how of information management or creating and maintaining the golden thread are still due to come down the line. Now, the HSC published some guidance on what building information should be included in safety cases and reports over the last few weeks. However, the secondary legislation containing the detailed information requirement is still to be published and it will be consulted on. So there are some questions that remain. What are the key challenges for the profession in the background of that context, what are some of the solutions that can be put in place in anticipation of these greater demands, what is deemed proportionate in the quest for actionable and accurate information for existing buildings, where are the biggest information gaps and how about filling them, and what about competence requirements, and talking about competence on fire risk assessments, we have finally seen some stronger competence requirements being put in place in the fire safety order via the Building Safety Act. And so what are the questions that organizations and people should be asking themselves and how can they document ongoing delivery against the fire risk assessment? We really would like to encourage you, our audience, to ask lots of questions so we can answer them. And you can ask them anytime during the webinar We'll pick them up in the Q&A box, so please don't use the chat for questions, but use the Q&A box. And if you want to remain anonymous, then please just put Anon in front of the question. Um, so if I may ask the panelists to briefly introduce themselves. Robert, can I start with you, please? Yes, yeah, so my name is Robert Norton. Um, I'm the team leader here at Plan Radar. And what my job has been is to work with construction companies, facility managers, um, housing companies and developers to actually digitize the golden thread in an easy to use format um, that's still making sure that people reach the, the goal of you know competency with what they're actually capturing, capturing and documenting on site. Thank you Robert and welcome. Anthony please. Uh, yeah, good morning or good afternoon all. Yeah, Anthony Taylor as the slide says I, I was uh, asked to chair working group eight which is the one that was set up to look at competence for the building safety manager as we all know that that particular role has gone but the function remains so at the bottom of that we were talking about powers eight six seven three so we've done a lot of work over the last few weeks and months to try and get the competence uh, re-engineered i should say for um safety uh, sort of the management of safety in residential buildings the other thing I, I do is chair, the, I'm the interim chair of the Building Safety Alliance, which is a forum across this sector, the occupied sector, which we're trying to build to uh, encourage cultural change on a basis. And we can talk about that later, should we need. Thank, Thank you. you Jack, welcome. Hi, I'm Jack White, Technical Manager at Clarion. Um, I lead a team um, to develop a golden thread for our existing uh, housing. Thank you all and I'm quite pleased that we have both private sector and social housing sector perspectives available today because very often the outcomes and of course fire safety and structural safety principles are the same. The approach, culture and delivery methodology is often very different and that can impact quite a bit on the outcomes that need to be achieved especially through the changes coming down the pipeline. Um, I'm going to go and hand over to Rob, who's got a, a presentation really around two of the key areas that Plan Radar is also working on. 
fire risk assessment and overall document management. So Rob, over to you, please. Brilliant. Thank you for handing over there, Sophie, and, and for having us here today. So as, as Sophie's just identified there, what we offer is a digital solution that documents uh, risk assessments on site and captures the golden thread and then make sure that all of the documents are in one central source location. With this, what we can provide you is making sure that the right person has the right information um, at the right time, whether they're on site or in the back office. So as a company, we work with, uh, as I said, the facility managers like uh, companies like British Land, obviously documented this information, the construction companies as well, once they're actually doing this and capturing this from the fire stopping, um, the EWS1 forms, then we go through to the likes of your, your Kiwa, which are actually doing the certification and the sign off of the EWS1 forms as well. Um, Arab again are using us for the fire risk assessments. Now, None of these two platforms or these two companies has the same information. What we can provide you with is a fully customized platform that meets your needs and requirements now, and that can be amended and customized free of charge in the future as any of these legislations changes. Um, obviously, we're working with the likes of uh, Peabody there as well, which is a housing association and is also using us for the insurance purposes. Oh, so I think I just double clicked there. OK, we're, we're back with all the different pieces of legislation and their forthcoming regulations. The key aspects to note are that all buildings will be impacted to a certain degree as the new legislation drives both standards and competence requirements. Um, I'll just briefly recap. The golden thread will contain the information and documents produced for registration and certification safety case, mandatory occurrence, reporting and residential engagement. Building which are, buildings which are newly built and have gone through in the gateway process will also have the information produced through the gateway process. For buildings going through prescribed refurbishment, the documents approved by the regulator under building control applications for building work in existing higher risk buildings will need to be sorted in the golden thread. I think that's changed over. There we go. For fire doors and passive fire protection, there's accurate linked records for specifications, fire test evidence and certification. Um, the gateway, before gateway one, is the brief audit, FRA, uh, between planning and design, safety case data audit, validate BIM models, feasibility and study. Gateway two, between design and build, the construction data collection, clerk of works monitoring and safety case data audit. Gateway three would be between the build and occupation, occupation, asset information, model for asset management, defect monitoring, and maintenance reports and checklists. There is much discussion in the media relating to how much inf of this information is passed from the construction phase um, through to the, the handover phase as well. And this is where a platform like Plan Radar can come in, obviously, to help support you with your OM manuals. Apologies, I think there's just a bit of a delay uh, between the screen sharing. So in Plan Radar, we believe in uh, the, the risk assessment of task. Uh, so transparent, tamper-proof audit trails and clear assigning of responsibility. Accurate data being recorded on site with visual evidence of photographs and videos collected and mandatory fields to ensure that the individuals carrying out the risk assessment, uh, the penetration ceiling are documenting this with photographic evidence from start to finish. With all the clients that we've been working in, they all have one key feature, is to have this simplicity on site to make sure the person that capturing and documenting it has a simple to use format on a mobile device or a tablet in their hands. If you're overcomplicating this, again, it goes back to this complementary of who can capture it. And this is where we sort of come into play. And again, knowledge that one place for all site data, your safety documents and reporting. 
So I've briefly brushed over of the FRAs and obviously the fire safety. What we're sort of doing here is whether you're uploading plans or drawings through to the, the mobile device or a BIM model, or if you don't have plans, there's no limitation. But what a, a fire risk assessor can come in and use this platform to do is make active pins or tasks within the platform that is assigned back through to the building owners like yourselves so that you actually have clear objectives to carry out on site with the risk assess with the risk levels as well you've then got all of that information documented for you and to hand at any point if you're actually a fire risk assessor the platform actually streamlines this entire process for you when you're capturing the information on site because once you've went and done your initial site visit you don't have to go back to the office and spend two days collating all of this information into a nice fancy PDF. You press one button in Plan Radar, and in less than 20 seconds, a full fire risk assessment report that is fully customized yourself is sent through to the client. Again, when we come into doing the EWS1 as an example as well, we're working with the uh, companies like the Axis Group that are doing the QA process with six or seven stages depending on what they're doing putting a pin on the plan updating it with all the photographs as well so that way when companies like Kiwa will come in to certify this and make sure it's been done to the standard they've got all the visual evidence based off of every individual pinpoint for the EWS1 inspection with that if you're hiring your own clerk of works to come in we can actually customize the system to make sure that specific individuals like the clerk of work are the only person that has the ability to close off certain tasks or sign off certain work as well um, and have their input with this it's documenting and capturing all the information so with this element here you're making sure that the people that are signing the work off or are adding these comments or recommendations in the construction phases are responsible for their actions as a client or in the facility element or with your handover as well, it's easy to locate and identify this information. So if we come into the, oh, I've gone too far, apologies there. There we go, we'll stick on fault recording. So this is when you can actually use the system for the full facility management side as well. So if you are walking around on site, it's nice and easy to locate any new issues and identify them off of your mobile phone. Again, just capturing it on the go, adding an instant photograph or a voice memo as well. Uh, so Plan Radar has instant voice to text dictation since you can instantly record that information instead of standing around typing and typing away or adding a few notes and coming back to the office so you can continue your job. So we're all about streamlining that initial process. Obviously, again, we can assign the work directly through to the specific people that you need to have a correspondence with, whether they be internal or, of it, or outsourced as well. Again, we've got to track the deadline status and so on. Mapping of assets. So anything that you're documenting or capturing in the system, can be customized or added to a fully bespoke uh, statistic or chart of any any type so this way you can discover trends who's responsible for what on your site and again any deadlines that you need to allocate handovers we've briefly gone over this um, so what we can do here is provide you a csv import or export directly from plan radar uh, pdf handovers as well where required we also have an open API and what's going to be key with the new legislations is that we can integrate with any governing body. That means if you capture and document this information from the EWS one form or on site that needs to be sent through to third party platforms, you can do it instantly from plan radar without having to do anything. Or again, you can go through to the exporting function via a CSV file. So if there is an off chance in five to 10 years time and something's come up, there's, there's been an issue on like what's happened with Grenfell, you can open your plan radar account or a digital solution that's similar and easily identify what was had, who was responsible, um, and then go through any claims management as well moving forward. We briefly touched on the platform is not just for fire, the golden thread and documenting this, but a full a CAFM system. And I'd just like to thank you all for my time, for your time, sorry.
Thank you, Robert. And we're going to go straight to questions. Um, and we've had quite a good response of questions already. Um, I think on the competence, we are definitely going to come back on that a little bit later in the questions and in the discussion, because we've got quite a few points to make around that. I just wanted to pick up on one of the first questions, and that was a very welcome reminder that, you know, we've, we're a very big uh, profession with a very large remit, and not everyone is uh, completely um, immersed in fire safety. And the golden thread emanates from uh, Dame Judith Hackett's report. And Robert, during his presentation, gave some very useful concrete examples of what will be included in the golden thread. But in essence, it's the information about a building that allows someone to understand a building and keep it safe. And the information management to ensure the information is accurate, easily understandable, and can be accessed by those who need it and is up to date. And that includes the regulator, for example. And um, thank you for that reminder, because all too often, I think we lose sight of what the golden thread is all, too, all about. And as well, the interaction with the safety case and the safety case report, those concepts are quite used, they're often used interchangeable. Um, to backtrack a little bit on the discussion or before we really dive into the discussion, um, Robert, you quickly touched on something during this presentation and that is who or rather which buildings are going to be affected by all the different pieces of legislation and their regulations coming down the line. Because so often we think that Dame Judith Hackett and the legislation that's following from that is all about higher risk buildings. But can I ask the comment, to, uh, the panel to comment on that, please? Anyone wants to go? Anthony. No, I was muted. <laughs> so shall I put my best foot forward? Yes. I, mean, I think, uh, the, uh, Robert, thank you very much for that. I think it's worth just uh, picking up what you were talking about competence and all this information, the Golden Thread Safety case. I think it's worth people just reflecting on how much information there is when we blandly say it's all the information that's necessary to understand how to manage a building. Uh, that is quite a lot of information. And where we, uh, I would say, as a profession, have over the years been very used to uh, doing the tests and the functions and keeping the management and the, the maintenance regimes. What we're talking about here, the, the fundamental shift, is, is looking at the base information of the, of the building. How is it structurally made? What's it made out of? Now, we've started doing that with the of cladding and IW, um, uh, uh, IWS forms and what have you. But I think one of the other things I just wanted to bring in is the fact that I, in the future, your fire risk assessor is going to be asking you for a lot more information before he turns up on site. What is the building made out of? How is the compartmentation and so on and so forth? So the collection of this data and having it accessible to a lot of people and accurate and verified is really a very significant uh, piece of work. It is. <laughs> and I think the point is that not just residential buildings are affected. Yeah are they? Because the part four um, duties, they're very much focused on residential high risk. Yeah, buildings. indeed they are, yeah. yeah. Um, but a lot of the part three duties in the Building Safety Act basically will affect not just new buildings, but also existing buildings that will be yeah. going through the process. And interestingly, the definition for higher risk buildings in part three doesn't include the word residential. Um, and uh, we've uh, also, we've got, we mustn't forget the, um, any refurbishments and things are done. It's not just the original building, it's, it's all the work that goes on um, in, in an operation, in any, any building that is operational of any, at any time. Great. Um, Jack, perhaps we can go with you next. Who do you think, the, what do the panel think is the biggest challenge with the golden thread moving from construction to the occupation phase? Well, I think we've kind of, um, it's something we've struggled with for many years in terms of that 
siloed working of someone works on a project to complete a new building and then someone else maintains it and and that that handover crossover um has never been uh worked on particularly well um across the sector i i would um suggest and i don't think i'd get too many people disagreeing there um and so i think what perhaps needs to be done a lot more is asset managers sitting down looking at what information they want and and it's the the the, the way you think about that information as well so do you want it in a database because you know for asset managers you might be looking at well i want to see everywhere across the stock where i have this type of fire door or this type of alarm um and that needs to be fed back in um to the the kind of employer's information requirements um so if you're looking at you know well i want documents here because i i think you know this is the the type of information if it's you know if i'm on site and i really want to understand the building really well but i want this information in a database so i can quickly and easily understand i can you know prioritize according to risk and so there's there's a lot of work to be done to understand um um, what information that we want and then pass that back and feed that back in so that those those new bills are are passing across information uh, in, in a way that is fit because I think with with you know the increased use of BIM you know that that information will be available um, but it's got to be passed across in the right way and I think that comes down to asset managers to to set out exactly um, you know how the information should work to allow them to work um, in the way they need to. Thank you. Robert or Anthony, do you do you have any thoughts to complement Jack's? Well, I, was going to, I was going to ask Jack whether, you know, he, with BIM, uh, is the construction side of the world is very used to BIM and it, it is producing it. I mean, I've come across issues where the, the, the um, developer or the, the client in, in, in construction terms hasn't actually necessarily um, specified what BIM model he wants. So they get given a BIM model that is appropriate or, or simpler for the developer, perhaps. So I would suggest from my experience that the, the client needs to develop, needs to define exactly what model he means, what does it mean? But then when you move that into the occupied sector, whether it's occupied in residential or any other thing, is the experience of people in, in 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 your knowledge that they can cope with BIM on on the on the other side once it's been given to us? So the simple answer is, of course, no. Yeah, <laughs> that's, well, that's that's an easy one. I'm not um, alone in that view. Then. Yes, uh, you know, I, I think you know, I, I I would suggest that the majority of um, certainly in the kind of housing association sector, um, the majority of um, developments that are, are are BIM developments the client has had very little input um, mm. to say what it is that they're looking for it so you know from a start they've not kind of defined that and then once once it's passed across you know there aren't the the, the systems even to allow people to properly access that and utilize mm. it let alone understand those systems and you know define new processes to allow them to utilize this data mm. yeah and no, i that's you know it's particularly in the private sector we may have a developer or client who then sells it on for another division within his own organization or sells it outside entirely uh, people are going to be given information which i suppose i was leading to um reflecting what you were asking sophie is the verification of this information when well, you take it on as an accountable person or when you take on your new building you've got to be absolutely certain what you've got is what you think you've got and make sure that it's right because you're going to be responsible for it and there's going to be an ever so much more detailed focus on, on the quality of information not just the volume of it and mm -hmm. i think that's a real issue for the industry not just that i do believe and then i've got to be careful here not to become a panelist myself um, is that we've got to be mindful that ultimately the building safety act when it moves from the uh, construction phase to the occupation phase. In the construction phase, you've got the, the amount of information that will be available will be much wider. 
than actually yeah. the scope that will be required under the Building Safety Act in the occupation phase, which will focus on fire safety and structural information. Whereas from the occupation phase, the expectation is that the uh, health and safety file will be handed over within that occupation phase, but that will not necessarily be enforced under the Building Safety Act. Of course, it will still be enforced or supposed to be enforced under the CDM. But we're having part of this conversation because we're trying to find a holistic solution for building information and making sure that the information is accessible in a rather holistic way, but actually with the variety of different pieces of legislation that are requiring different things, that that might in itself be a little bit of a challenge. I, I want to move to a question um, around proportionality because Proportionality is a word that's been bandied around quite a bit, especially in the latter stages of the legislation. Um, it was the word used to get rid of the duty to appoint a building safety manager because um, it was suggested that that position might cost too much and therefore the amount of money needing to be spent was disproportionate. Proportionality keeps on popping up, whether we're talking about PEEPs, whether we are talking about information gathering, and it will be applied to the golden thread as well. And, and that's possibly uh, the reason why we haven't seen secondary legislation, because really that word proportionality is being weighed to its micrograms. Um, so what do you think proportionality means for ex information gathering in the existing buildings. Will I kick off there? Yes. Yeah, well, I think um, in terms of a golden thread, I think a lot of information is currently generated from, you know, existing processes when someone goes out to repair or replace, you know, they they will, you know, have information about what is there or they will have information about a new product being installed. And I think you know, really what what the focus is on with the golden thread really is is capturing the information coming out of these processes that, that we don't really do and keeping that in one kind of single source of the truth. Um, so that, you know, if you want to know, you know, what has happened to a fire door and the door closer, let's say, over a period, you can see, you know, when it was replaced, when it's due to be replaced, um, you know, all, all the types of information that is fairly standard with an asset management, but then you would also have information, you know, about the, the product that was installed, stored in that, you know, within that same system and not, you know, going out to a contract manager who has it or, you know, asking a contractor who has it. You know, a, a lot of the time the information is already there and um, there certainly is, you know, further to go in terms of, you know, making sure there's a consistency of that information. Um, and, and, you know, I think having the competence um, to make sure we know what information is required. But I, I don't think there's necessarily, it, it's not that we've kind of necessarily got to break new ground in terms of the data that we, we will be asking for. Okay. Anthony, I know that you're quite passionate about this topic. <laughs> Uh, one of the questions that comes up often, and I have debated, is the word proportionality, particularly in existing buildings. And I, I take by way of example, do you need a centimetre correct plan of the building? Or would a line plan be adequate? Because uh, fundamentally, the, the, the Act requires the management of spread of fire and structural safety. Now, I'm just talking now about plans. So, providing you've got a floor plan, and in my mind, I'm old enough to remember something called a fire certificate, where it was a line diagram and a lot of stuff put on it, which was very useful because it actually was a very simple way, uh, uh, um, an image it would be called now. It wasn't those days, it was a plan, but an image these days, which gave you a lot of information very quickly. Uh, and I think, you know, what we've got to balance out is useful information from mass detail information, particularly in, in, in existing buildings where there may be very little, if I put it. Um, I've had similar conversations uh, about, and I've said, you know, if it's not that not that very old, go back to the CDM files to start, you know, have a look at that. You should have had a lot of information in that. 
be that the health and safety file or the ONM manuals and the handover documents there. But make sure that they're actually accurate. Uh, come back and we won't go into the, the point of as built as opposed to as designs, but it is that sort of information. So I think proportionality will also depend on the complexity of, of the building. You know, what you need the information and you'll be tested by the regulator on the information that you have. Is it adequate for you to understand the risks in your building and you being able to manage the risk assessment? And that's, you know, that's going to be, it's going to be a, a call someone makes. But if you can give a, a, a reasonable explanation of why you've made those choices, which is in many ways part and parcel of the safety case report, then you, you should be fine. But I, I take, for example, a portion proportionality i personally it's my opinion so you know don't don't take it as gospel for lord's sake but you know i don't think one would need inch or sorry centimeter correct drawings plans for an existing building unless there's a damn good reason for it does that sort of partially answer your question so if we, by way of illustration <laughs> could go on but i won't <laughs> robert do you have anything that you want to add from your perspective not really on the portionality side of it, it was more based off of what, what they were sort of saying previously. If, if you are using these BIM models, and this is obviously always the problem when there's a, you know, if you're using a BIM model, what you've got there is an easy design of all the fire doors, as an example, being used across the entire project. And then it comes down to whose responsibility is it to check to make sure they are the right fire doors that have been installed from the design through to the actual build phases. Um, which goes back into what Jack was sort of saying there is obviously if there were issues with certain fire doors or you can easily identify them across the entire site and put them into a statistic of look these are the high risk issues or what, whatever just a fire door as an example but whatever element it might be um, but it all goes down to what's actually been built and who's who's the person inspecting that um, that's that's obviously the key area and I know a lot of people struggle with that so I would say, take, uh, Rob, taking your, your, your point about fire doors, the fire door as a compartment compartmentation issue is a matter of a number of components, yep. including the door, including the closure, including the intermission strips, the potential for post boxes and all that sort of thing. So, uh, again, proportionality, you've got to look at what he needs. You're trying to be gather a proportion, the right information about. Some things are going to need much more detail than others. And I think doors are a good example of, you know, thinking about what information you actually need to, to manage these assets. So, you know, see a, a, num a number of our properties where we have open balconies and we have um, uh, fire doors installed for every flat entrance door. Now, of course, at the end of the open balcony, that's that's not required. But, you know, so you've, you've got to understand what what the requirements are. You know, not just what's actually there. You can have a thirty, you know, a thirty-minute fire door installed, but you might not need to to um, maintain it such. So it's good to kind of understand the design intent as well as what you actually have. Thank you. I think you know you've all made really useful points, and I think they mostly come down to what is the purpose and the use of that information, and make sure to validate that information because what's there needs to be correct. Um, I will come back to validation a little bit later on because there are some questions that relate to that and competence. But before we move there, I wanted to just uh, touch on the fact that at this point in time, when we don't know yet fully what uh, the exact level of information will be required uh, in the golden thread. And when, when we first came together, uh, in advance of this webinar, we spoke quite a bit that organizations really need to think about how they should go about building up this information. And Jack, I, I wanted to go to you because you had even, you had quite a theory that wasn't necessarily based on the information as such. <laughs> um, yes, well, I guess um, what we are looking at is, is more having a, a uh, a vision of how we see um, data being used um, and I think um, that having that um, and, and, and understanding that you know from from day one of um, you know enforcement if, if that's you know October 23 or whenever it might be we won't have all the information but if we have um, a vision and and 
you know, are working on that vision to create a, a system and the, the processes, you know, a, a framework that will allow us to, at some point, have, you know, all the information we think is, is, is necessary, then, then that will put us in a good position. And, and I think there is, you know, it's easy to kind of look at it and feel, feel overwhelmed by the, um, the amount of information and not necessarily knowing where to start. But, you know, if you, if you break it down and, and our, our vision is, is, is fairly simple, I would, I would suggest. So it's, you know, defining all the, all the kind of components that you think are, are within scope and then thinking about what information do you want in them. And then, you know, should that be in a, a, a database or a, a document, as I kind of said before, and then having a, a unique ID for all these elements or components elements um, that is based on a, a, an asset hierarchy. And with that, then unique ID, any, any document, uh, any interaction with it, um, any information about it is, is saved against that. And, and that allows you to, to really easily understand your building and, and not go into lots of different places. Now, you know, we, we feel a 3D model is, is, is part of that for us, but, you know, I think I would, I would agree with, um, you know, the uh, kind of fellow panelists. You don't, you don't necessarily need, you know, uh, a very kind of, um, that's not necessarily a requirement, but we, we see that as potential value that we can, we can drive and, and not just necessarily tick the boxes to meet the minimum requirements. So we, we don't think we'll probably meet the minimum requirements on day one, but we want to go beyond the minimum requirements come day 10,000. I should probably not explore this for, because compliance is enormously important and God knows who from enforcement is on this webinar. Um, but you, you raise an interesting point against what the legislation will require by potentially October 2023. You know, some of the fire safety regulation information requirements need to be delivered by January. We had the Golden Thread lead at our conference and we talked about timelines and possibly Golden Thread secondary legislation would be implemented by October 2023. So what do you think is going to be feasible? And, and I would like all of your thoughts on this because Robert, you will obviously bring an idea from well, the technology might be here. I don't want to prejudge what you're going to say, but but you bring different perspectives to this. So what will be feasible against the desirable? I think I'd just like to pick up on what Jack was saying, the view he, he has put forward. Uh, they, there's a bit of a difference, I think, in the public, you know, let's say the public, the private sector, or let's be more, more precise, is those landlords or owners who hold those buildings for long years, for many years, will have a different perspective to those who are going to buy and sell them. So where Jack was saying, sit back and strategize what you're going to actually want for this data, I, I think is vital. You know, the, the, I, I know of organizations running around saying, well, I've got a damn good idea what I'm going to need, just piling it into an electronic dustbin and they're going to end up with a bigger problem than they've got in the first place. So I, I think it, playing to your question is what is feasible will depend on where you are in the market. Are you going to hold the property? Are you going to sell it regularly, uh, et cetera? And actually, whether you have taken a short-term or a long-term view on how you're going to collect this and what you're going to deal with it. And uh, as Jack says, is your endpoint minimum requirements or operationally more efficiency. So I, I believe that it is really important for people to sit back for five minutes or probably five months and work out what it is they're actually trying to achieve from this, regardless of the regulations. Mm -hmm. You know, regardless of regulations, we know the regulations are coming. What is going to suit your company in order to deal with or your organization in order to, with all this collection of information? So, and I think the feasibility of where they'll get to will, will come out of that sort of conversation. So I, I just, oh, sorry, if I just jump oh. in very quickly, Robert, <laughs> um, just to kind of um, back that up a little bit, but also when you say five months, uh, you know, this was this was an idea kind of conceived in terms of how we would work in 2018. You know, it, it's, not, it's not simple. Hopefully, you know, the opportunity to kind of, um, exchange ideas and, and learning means that it, you know it won't be that long for other people but it, it's it is it's not simple 
And I think, you know, there are there need to be balances struck here in terms of, you know, we can look to progress our 3D models to a stage where um, they're kind of hopefully done by um, October 23. But if we do that, then we will be late in the delivery of floor plans for um, January um, 23. So, but then if we if we prioritise January 23, perhaps, and, and go with floor plans more like um, were kind of described earlier, um, then, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll be delayed in terms of our, our, our kind of golden thread by October 23. So I think there's there's a lot out there. Um, and I think, you know, I, I would like to think that if you can demonstrate a programme um, to a regulator in terms of how you're going to be able to meet it, not necessarily from day one, but you can demonstrate the work done to date and say, we will continue this and we will hit it by that point. They might then ask you to bring that forward, but I, I would be surprised if, if you know, demonstrating that you can do it and you are on a path towards achieving it wasn't, you know, um, uh, something that the regulator would like to see. Robert. Yeah, no, thank you very much. Um, so obviously we come from a, a different perspective there is to help try and take companies like Jack Digital. I love everyone's goal is to have something tomorrow or, or next week why is this not already perfect for us is is what we always come up against but depending on the role who you are so someone like a, if you're a fire risk assessor you can have something ready for your digital within within about a week and then you're ready to go out and start using the system if you're obviously a building owner this is going to take again what some what sort of jack has sort of said there it depends on what you're looking to capture. Now, if you're looking for the bare, the bare minimum of what you're looking to document within any sort of platform, you can have something up and running. And as long as you know the information for going to a system like ourselves, you can have something up and running within a, a matter of weeks to, to months, obviously, depending on the system you're going for. What we're sort of trying to do here at, at our end in Plan Radar, depending on, you know, we're waiting for all the legislations to come out will be delivering a solution that actually documents all of the information from start to finish for EWS one, fire door surveys, fire risk assessors. So it's a custom built golden thread platform uh, for the building manager. We're also working with the construction oh. companies as well. It's all in a nice, easy to use digital platform. Um, Robert. I had a question yep. from uh, Philip Melson, and he wanted to understand if it's tailored specifically for residential or can be utilized covers commercial and mixed use. And that's obviously plan radar solution. Quick one as an interview. Yeah. yeah, no, so plan radar is fully customized, no matter who you are, whether you are building tunnels, house how, you know, houses, small development, all the way on to mega and superstructures as well. It's customized from project to project or your overall account as well. Um, and we can feed into capturing the same information or just bespoke the project to project. So it's entirely down to you as a business. Okay, thank you for that. Um, we touched on it a little bit earlier, contract manager, the word fell. And I think that's an important arena because obviously um, lots of stakeholders are going to need to work together to deliver the outcomes that are being sought by the golden thread. Um, and we haven't really talked about all the different contractual relationships between all parties involved in information management for the organization. So I'd like to get the panel's thoughts really on, on what do you foresee some of the issues? What do you think about that statement? Um, and what do you expect? Anthony, did you want to go? Uh, well, it's uh, it is like any contract. It's vital that you're very clear what it is you want, uh, uh, and um, yeah. oh. Will I jump in while. Well, yes, please do, Jack. <laughs> um, well, so I think you know when I'm talking about you know not envisaging meeting requirements on day one that is because we have existing contracts and you know we have organizations that you know are set up to deliver on that contract and you know existing ways of working and processes and and that will need to change in order to deliver information in the way we're looking for it and so I think it would be the next time we go out 
um, to kind of um, procure, uh, then we would look to put that within the contract so that they're obligated to, and, and, and know right from the start, you know, if, if we often, I'm sure other people have it with contracts, if, you know, you have um, what, what the contract is set up for, and if, if you um, try and have variations or additions or anything, then then the value seems to drop somewhat, I would suggest. And, and so, I, you know, I think it is, it is both a, a problem at the start, but in, in the longer term, a way to make sure that we, we get exactly what we're looking for. Thank you, Jack, um, for saving Anthony when his words were lost in the ether, I'm afraid to say. Oh, did, I, did I disappear? My apologies. But I think I, I've just, the only bit I'd add, um, with the same probably Jack, it, it comes back to your feasibility. You need to understand and what's feasible uh, and what is what are you going to need to do because by October 20 when this goes live you're going to have to register this building and pretty soon after right. Robert do you want to uh, step in <laughs> <laughs> well, so no, no I, I don't mainly I don't deal with contracts managers whether you're using plan radar or another platform if you are ensuring in your contract that someone is using a tool solution of sort that is custom built to document or capture this information it just en enables you to easily identify what is being recorded what's being captured on site and then you can manage this and it a lot of the systems out there are are simple and intuitive to use so you can just pick this up and have the overview and my suggestion would be to start ensuring that you know, your projects are being built with a digital solution of some sort. Thank you. Um, sorry, Anthony, we we lost you again. Did I, did I disappear again? <laughs> Shall Blowing we read... hot air into the ether just before you say something <laughs> rude, so I, 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 uh, no, I, was, I think it's probably been said by the other two, but as I say, you need to prioritise the information you need. And if you've got to create a safety case and you've got to create a a building risk assessment you need to have that information to have mm -hmm. um so that's one thing but you know with the, the competence of it and it, it's not just the competence of the company it's the competence of the individuals in the company who are providing you with the service that you're supposed to be getting and with regards to it i should take a very clear look at whether they are capable truly of swapping information between systems between apis and things a lot of people say it is open well, I can do it with an API, but there are often added costs in that. And I would just ask that question very directly. It's a delighted interoperability conundrum. Um, perhaps we'll park that for later because there have been quite a few questions coming in around competence, but actually also one that still covered the scope of buildings. So we've had an anonymous question come through, uh, whether the golden thread covers all buildings such as hospitals and schools, as well as residential. And um, I'm going to tie that in with a question that I had um, as well for the panel, because uh, in short, yes, the golden thread will cover those buildings, but there are some questions around that because obviously, well, hospitals are covered by part three duties, and therefore there will be a handover moment where all the information needs to be handed over to someone. Now, hospitals and schools don't fall under the duties for occupation in the Building Safety Act, but of course there are other pieces of legislation that still move forward. So we're going to move to a situation where hospitals will go through refurbishment and they've got all this information that needs to be handed over to who? Where is it going to go? Do the panel have thoughts? Well, there's well, another thing you've got to save us here. here. <laughs> uh, I, I, I mean, at the end of the day, I think it's going to fall back to the the, the person in you know the, 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 what, I'm trying to think of the, the authority responsible for the hospital, but they won't know what to do with it. I suspect so it'll end up with an FM fundamentally. Uh, and I think, you know, that given the nature of the people I, I suspect are on this call, uh, I, I can see a day, and I've had this discussion with you, Sophie, before, that where the FM contract is going to be more important for the owner than the, manager, the uh, property manager contract. 
Um, you know, I think this data management, which I would suggest FNs are more able to deal with than the average property manager, um, might shift the balance. And I think um, you guys need to think about that um, just generally as having much more direct interaction with the owners of these buildings or the you know, and, and the operators of these buildings, whether they be residential or hospital or anything else, as opposed to a managing agent total who might be managing more of the financial stuff and the leasing and stuff, but rather than the actual management of this vital data that we're talking about. Yes, and I guess part of the reason why I asked the question is because the policy is a bit quiet at this point in time. But if, if nothing else, I guess we'll have to fall back on the fire safety order and the responsible person will need to manage the information, um, which very often will be the FM, whether it's liked or not, um, because that's where the duties will eventually um, end. Now, I think it's time that we do touch on all the different competence questions, because there are quite a few. Um, and you know, competence was is is one of the cornerstones actually for everything that's coming down the line, um, because you may have all the systems and processes in place. If you don't have the competent people, then frankly, they're not going to necessarily fulfil the outcomes and impacts that they need to deliver on. And in in terms of answering Philip's question on how to define competence, uh, the last five years. Um, the work that actually Anthony and I have been doing competence very much revolves around the skills, knowledge, expertise and behaviours that people need to have to carry out a particular role. Um, and to get to the wider question on um, fire risk assessments and management, um, do, do the panel have any thoughts about what's coming down the line? Because obviously the Building Safety Act and I'm quoting is actually talking about sufficient training and experience or knowledge and other qualities to enable the person properly to assist in making or reviewing assessments. So Who's going to be go. competent to deal with this? <laughs> well, they, I, I'll have a go, providing I don't disappear again. Uh, <laughs> what Sophie was talking about is, is the various groups that we've been involved with. That there is a new... Um, British standard. It's called a FLEX 8670, and that sits right at the apex of a whole plethora of competent standards that are being developed by the British Standards Organisation. Now, Sophie and I have been particularly involved with uh, three of them, one for the principal designer, one for the principal contractor, and one for what was the building safety manager, but is now management of safety in residential buildings. But ignoring those which are very specific, uh, 8670 is setting out parameters for competence requirements to work anywhere in the built environment. That includes the fixtures, the fittings, the, the, you know, the FMs, anybody who's working in the built environment will slowly hopefully creep up to this point where these um, parameters are set out in 8670. That is a framework for individual competencies and each discipline or professional body or trade body is slowly but steadily taking that framework and applying it to their own um, skill sets. And then over the next X number of years, and it, uh, you know, it, it, it can't happen instantly, but the expectation will happen, it will be progressive and fairly far quickly progressive, that people will be tested against it. We are just discussing uh, for one of a better word, 867B, which is looking at how organisations are tested. We've all been quite used to test, being tested for the uh, CDM. We're looking at competence and resources. Um, so we, we are now looking within these various groups at how to test organisations at a competence level and including this new thing called behaviours. And within an organisation, one might look at behaviours as being a uh, what is the culture of this build, of this organisation? Is it no blame? Is it encouraging? Does it provide the training, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. Behaviour has been added in because I think uh, all the reports that have come out and uh, uh, basically chastised the whole. Uh oh. 
Robert, did you want to come in? Yeah, so I, I can obviously only talk from the sort of element that we come from and, and the digital world is if you are introducing a digital platform is ensuring that the the individuals carrying out the work, whether it be the fire stopping, installation of fire doors, have got the right documentation in their hand and the right installation methods in their hand at any given time. Obviously, you being the building owner, if you know that they've got this documentation, you have automatic read receipts as well, showing that they've read this information and you can get a digital sign off to say, look, they are competent and you've got that documented in-house. Now, with that, then you can obviously provide the photographic evidence that has been done to the right standards throughout that entire journey that you have the overview to inspect at any time. Or obviously, if there is an issue, you can you can flag that up. I can only talk from the competence from a from a digital perspective as opposed to the whole the wider view, uh, which is obviously Anthony was filling in for us there. I think you got disconnected again, Anthony. So back back over to yeah, you. I was just filling in. I, I apologize. So, um, I just wanted to come back to Philip's question as well, because obviously people don't want to be held uh, liable for undertaking um, fire risk assessments where they might not be deemed competent. And for the fire risk assessor, that particular one, there is a framework actually in the making within the wider complex that Anthony was outlining. Um, now, I, Gillian has asked quite um, a poignant question around the responsibility for providing all of this information uh, and, and who precisely is going to be responsible to deliver the information. And the question that she had, she offered a few job titles on there, job roles, fire officer, state information lead, or health and safety lead. And I, I feel this is the moment where I should say that um, we, there was a clear duty or a position that would do this, which was the building safety manager. And obviously that duty to appoint the building safety manager is has been pulled from the legislation. So in effect, you've got an accountable person who will be accountable to deliver on this, but it absolutely leaves the question standing, where is going to be the responsibility? Where will it lie to deliver this information? And what did the panel think about where this will fall? I'll, 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 I'll see if I can do it quickly in case it just I disappear again. But fundamentally, as you rightly say, the accountable person in residential is going to be responsible. So it will come down to who do they employ, who do they contract with, which is something we touched on earlier. You've got to be absolutely clear on what you're expecting people to deliver on your behalf. So it could be it will depend on contractual arrangements. Now, it might be a managing agent, but then managing agents may not want that responsibility. It might be an FM, but they might not want bits of it. So I would say both parties, uh, the, the owner, the client, whatever you want to call, or the managing agent it's for and on behalf of, from an FM point of view, need to look very carefully at their contracts and decide what they want to do and what they're prepared to do. Thank you. I am uh, a little bit gobsmacked by the time uh, because there were loads more questions that I had and people in the audience had, but I'm going to have to do one final roundup question. And that really is um, a lot of changes continuing to come. What is your top tip for the question that people should be really asking themselves to make sure that they implement this properly? So I guess I'll, I'll jump in there quickly. Um, yeah, uh, it, while there is very little time, um, do try and take some time to, to really think about what it is that you're trying to achieve. Try and think about the, the, the outcomes that you want, the, the outputs, the goals. Don't just, you know, think, OK, well, that's probably in the golden thread, so I'll, I'll collect that. Uh, that probably is too. And, oh, we've got this information, so we, we can use that, you know, someone mentioned O&Ms before but you know I, I see them passed across where cavity barriers say and it, it lists four models with fire rating from 15 minutes to 300 minutes well you don't know what you've got in there and you don't know the requirements are so just take the time to think about what you want um, and how you're going to get there don't don't just jump in with with what you currently have thank you Robert top tip for moving forward 
I think Jack sort of nailed that on the head. Obviously, if you're going to go to a digital solution, make sure you know what you're sort of capturing now or at least have a clear goal of what you want to capture and document now. If you are going to adapt any sort of platform in the future, obviously have a clear guidance of, look, as and when things change, let's make sure we're ready for this. Um, yeah. Thank you. Anthony? Uh, I would naturally agree with the other two. I think you need to have a you sit down and carefully think about what you're trying to achieve. But as I mentioned the last time, you know, you also need to understand your contractual arrangement. How are you going to deliver this whole package? And then the information needs to be thought through very carefully as well. Okay, thank you all. And well, again, actually, thank you, Robert, Jack and Anthony, really very much for your contributions. And thank you to our listeners for paying attention and uh, giving us all these challenging questions. A recording will be available for anyone who wants to listen again or share with a friend. And I want to also say a quick thank you to our webinar support team, Sheila and Lucy. Um, we look forward to welcoming you again next week for our last episode before the summer break. And um, that is it for us for today. Thank you all and until soon. Bye. Thank you all. Thank Have you a good time. Day. Take care.